Please receive his gift to you tonight and his gift to the body of Christ. Papa, it's your house. Come on, give God the praise, give God the praise. Give God the praise, give God the praise, give God the praise. Come on, lavish him, lavish him. Be excessive, be extreme. I was glad, I was glad, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Are you glad to be here tonight? I cannot hear you, Lagos. So you're glad to be here tonight. You may be seated in his presence. <laughs> I am so honored and delighted to have another opportunity uh, to greet you and to stand behind this sacred desk because behind the illustrious, incomparable erudite and charismatic leadership of Pastor Paul Adderson and his lovely wife Yvonne. Let us acknowledge them if we will, as they are, as they are a crown on your head. <laughs> to all of the men of God that are doing the rostrum, those some that I know and some that I don't know, and to all of those that have come with me, my choices, salutations, and greetings, and most humble uh, acknowledgement of the gift of God that rests upon you and the privilege that has been afforded to me that I might be able to talk to a royal priesthood and a holy nation of people that have assembled in one place at one time to receive the word of the Lord. Are you in the house tonight? Are you in the house? Are you in the house? Grace and peace be multiplied. In the interest of time, I'm going to move expeditiously toward my text. I was, uh, my daughter was so honored to be here last night. Thank you for your warm reception. Amen. She blessed us and she was blessed as well uh, to be here. Um, because Pastor Paul has acknowledged those that are traveling with me, I will avoid that protocol and follow his lead and go directly into the crappling, the crappling that comes with aligning yourself with a word that is in itself a testimony of struggle, atrocities and trials and tribulations and is an expression of a position and a posture of resilience and defiance to the temptation to be shifted. The one word is unshaken. Unshaken doesn't mean nothing tried. It doesn't mean that nothing came. It doesn't mean that I didn't have opposition. It doesn't mean that I didn't feel the gravitational pull beneath my feet to crumble up under the weight of the load that I have unjustly had to carry to be who I am. But it does mean that even at my greatest moment of temptation to be crushed, that something in me resisted the pull of normal status quo and stood in utter defiance and said, I am still here. You have to be tough to be unshaken. Look at somebody and say, I'm still here. Yeah, they tried to rock me. They tried to block me. Sometimes I got in my own way. Sometimes the forces that fought me were not even tangible or touchable or relatable or that I could see or that I could name. I was fought by the invisible as much as the visible. But after it all passed over sickness and health and better and worse and richer and poor and good economies and bad economies, a whole lot of people left, but I am still here. Oh, do you hear what I'm saying to you? 
I shed some tears, I wept sometimes, some nights I cried myself to sleep. Sometimes I did not feel as faith-filled as I do sitting here now, surrounded by the saints. Sometimes fear was beating in my chest like hands beating on a drum. But when the beating stopped, my heart kept ticking and I am still here. I want the defiant, the radical, the relentless, the tenacious, the stubborn, the strong people in this room to stand up and shout at me I am still I am. you don't know how you made demons tremble when you said that you don't know how hell got nervous when you said that you don't know how witches started making excuses when you said that. you don't know how many afflictions had to fall off of you when you said that because they were sent on assignment to crush you but come hell or high water with your defiant self the kingdom suffered violence and the violent take it by force shout it out i am I'm still here. Give him a praise in this house. Yes, 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 yes. Who I feel that thing. I had to just get that out of my chest. Because I've had some winds that tried to knock me back. I've been through some tests and trials that weren't easy to get through. <laughs> Hallelujah, every birthday is a celebration because I am still here. <laughs> oh, you can't celebrate it if you only had 10 birthdays. You can't do it if you only had 15. You can't even do it if you had 21. But if you've been around 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years, if you had to fight trouble and storms and tests and trials and sickness and disease, then we need to throw a party tonight and let the devil know if I don't take another step, I'm going to praise him for where I am right now. me that smiled in my face and tried to cut my throat. I know they waited on my demise and expected me to crumble up under the pressure of their stare and their gaze. But if you see any of them, please do me a favor and deliver them a message and let them know I am still Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sit down. Y'all get me started. Y'all get me started. I got to go to work. I got to go to work. <laughs> I love you back. You know I love you. I eat your food. I wear your clothes. I travel in your markets. I order your stuff. You know I love you. This is not just... A preacher from America coming to preach. You know I'm family. You know I'm connected to you. You know I eat your jollof of rice and your fufu. And you know I am connected to you. And you see me wear your stuff in America. Not just over here, but around the world. And you know we are family. And the ocean is not wide enough to separate blood. 
as soon as we start to understand that we will begin to regenerate a society that is powerful spiritually, economically, and socially, that if a brother moves to another part of the world, he doesn't cease to be your brother because of water. Because water is never as strong as blood. And if we have the same blood, what can the water do about it? The Bible said there are three that bear record in earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood. If we got the blood, we got everything that we need to establish who we are. The DNA is in the blood. The health is in the blood. The life is in the blood. We have the blood, the blood of the lamb, the blood of the soil, the blood of our ancestry, the blood of our tenacity. It runs through all of us and as soon as we figure out that we are better together than we are apart, then we can rise up and build and be noticed as one of the greatest nations in the world because nations are not determined by geography. A nation is bigger than geography. If you move to Dubai, do you cease to be a Nigerian? <laughs> If you move to Haiti, do you cease to be a Christian? The being is in you. It's not on you. It's not your address. It's not your location. It's not the street you live on. It is the way you think, the way you breathe, the way you function, the way you dance, the way you move, the way you stand, the way you fight the way you live it has nothing to do with your address in fact your address will change many times through life but no matter where you live I am still I will begin a journey that will take the next three days to complete. But let us journey to the book of Acts, chapter 27, verse number 27 through 32, and there you will find my assignment for tonight, my assignment is cradled in the text, Acts 27, 27 through 32. It is a prophetic utterance to you, a rhema, a Kairos word for such a time as this, revealing the sensitivity that God knows where you are and what you are going through and who has been sent to attack you. But don't let any of those things move you. Follow me now as we start the journey toward our destiny. As we finish the final chapters of our biography, as we put the final touches on the concerto, the composition for which we were born to create. There has never, ever been another you. Even if you have a twin, it's not you. If you have a child, it's not you. You are a designer's original. And when he made you, he broke the mold. 
Nobody has your voice print. Nobody has your fingerprint. Nobody has your style. Often imitated, but never duplicated. You are in a class hall by yourself. And if you throw me away, you will never have another one. Because I alone am called for such a time as this. And so are you. And if I'm talking to you already, holler at your boy. We zero in to the text in the 27th chapter of the book of Acts, beginning at verse number 27 through 32, reading out of the New King James Version to add clarity to the complexity of the times in which we now find Paul. It is important to note that we are looking at him through the microscopic lens of his traveling companion, Luke, who is not just there to keep the apostle company, but to chronicle the moments of the apostle's life that was hidden from view. Thank you, Brother Luke, because without you writing about these moments in Paul's life, there would be a vacuum and a void of truth that would leave our intellect desolate, that you can be anointed and in trouble. They didn't hear me. Let me talk to y'all. You can be anointed and in trouble. You can have favor and be in a fight. You can be gifted and still face the galing winds of opposition fighting you tooth and nail to accomplish your task. So don't you be weary in well doing. For we shall reap in due season if we faint not. Now when the 14th night had come, and as we were driven up and down in the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors sensed that they were drawing near some land. Oh God, you know you have to be good without calculator to sense I am almost there. <laughs> it's some people in this room without even measuring it yet, you sense in your spirit, I'm almost there. I'm on the apex of a revolution. <laughs> I'm right on the edge of a new beginning. I am almost there. I can just tell. I don't need a word from a prophet to know it. I got a witness in my belly. I am almost there. Like a woman in the third trimester of childbirth, she knows when she's about to deliver the baby, sometimes better than the doctor. Doctor, come quickly. I am almost there. How do you know the pain has gotten harder, more rapid, more intense? The water has broken. The greater the pain, the greater the push. I am almost there. So I have to change who I hang around. Because some people I could afford to hang around when I wasn't so close. But now I'm so close. I have to be more discriminatory in who I allow to have access to me because I can sense that I am almost there. Let's go on. 
I couldn't I couldn't help it. I had to take that little moment. And they took surroundings and found it to be 20 fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they took surroundings or tests to see where they were and found it to be 15 fathoms by testing how long it took from the sound to return from the bottom of the ocean, the echo, the vibration, the thrust of it, how, how far are we from the bottom of the ocean. Then fearing lest we should run aground on the rocks, they dropped boom, 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 four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, when they had let down the skiff into the sea under the pretense of putting out anchors from the prow, they were only pretending to put out anchors. They were trying to leave. Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the skiff and let it all fall off. My subject, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, family, the Holy Spirit told me to tell you, don't let the storm stop you. Now, if you have no storms, I have no message for you. <laughs> but if you're in the middle of a twister right now and all hell is breaking loose, God said, don't let the storm stop you. I want you to touch 10 people and say, don't let the storm stop you. Don't let it stop you, baby. Don't, don't let it stop you. 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 Don't let the storm stop you. I know it's bad, but don't let it stop you. I know you cried. Don't let it stop you. I know you don't have all the money, but don't let the storm stop you. I know your friends are talking about you, but don't let the storm stop you. Who am I talking to? Don't let the storm. Don't let, don't let, don't let, don't let, don't let in the balcony. Don't let the storm. Don't let, don't let in the back row. Don't let, don't let, don't let the storm stop you to the business. But don't let the stop to the elected official. Don't let the storm stop to the religious leader. Don't let the storm stop you to the denominational leader. Don't let the storm stop you to the single mother don't let the storm stop you to the father who's looking for a job don't let the storm stop you to those of you who are in the greatest storm of your life don't let the storm stop you for those of you who travel for miles to be here you came to get this gailing wear tonight don't let the storm stop you I know you're up against it witches are fighting you demons are fighting you sickness is fighting you time is fighting you health is fighting you energy is fighting you your own mind is fighting you but time said don't let the storm stop you you may be seated chill chill relax be cool be comfortable what's up how you doing what's going on I missed you <laughs> We have stepped into the Acts of the Apostles, the second installment in the writing of Luke, the physician, who writes with much more detail than Matthew or Mark because he is an intellect. He is an intellect understanding God through the physicalities of the human frame. He is given to detail and with great articulation of speech, he writes for us the gospel of St. Luke and then adds an appenditure that we now call the Acts of the Apostles, which really should be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And it begins, the former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do 
and to teach the former treaties have I made of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach is the gospel of St. Luke. The amended chapters are, now that I have told you about the former treaties of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach, let me show you what happened after he stepped on the limousine service of a cloud and escaped into the atmosphere and left his disciples gazing upwards. And the angels said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing? This same Jesus that you see us sin shall descend in like manner. And we wondered what happened next. So Luke picks up his pen and writes the former treatise have I made. O oh, Theophilus of all that Jesus began both to do and to meet and to teach until he was taken up after showing himself alive for 40 days with many infallible proofs. And then he warns in the verse, eighth verse, you shall receive power. Dunamis, dynamite, not exousia, that's authority. We get that too. But authority without dunamis is impotent. It's the title without the ability to sign the check. <laughs> dunamis. <clears throat> dunamis affects objects, moves turbine walls, changes barriers, moves posts. Houses filled with smoke. A house is not filled with smoke because you have exousia authority. A house is filled with smoke and the post is door moved because you have dunamis. Some stuff we need to move. We don't need to just intimidate it. We need to move it. You shall receive dunamis. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses of me, both in Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Look at God's vision. God's vision is bigger than geography. If you think that God is only interested in a particular location, you deny him of being God of the whole earth. We cannot sequester God in America. You cannot sequester him in Nigeria because our countries are too small to hold the weight of his glory. We can touch the hem of his garment, but we cannot we cannot handle his train for it fills the temple and his authority is so big that he sits on the circle of the earth and he has all power in his hand. Let me take just a moment because we have fallen in church but not God. We've fallen in love with church but not God. We know church, but we don't know God. And when we fall out with church, we fall out with God. There's a great deal of difference between church, which is his ambassador, and God, which is the master himself. He's God. There has never been a God before him. There will never be another God after him. He himself looked for another God and finding no other God than himself said, I swear by myself that surely blessings I will bless thee and multiplying I will multiply. He concluded, I alone am God. I am the beginning and the end. I am the first and the last. I am he which is and was and shall be. I am that I am. I am the all-sufficient one. I am El Shaddai. I am the sovereign king, gentle enough to be the lily of the valley, fragile enough and fragrant enough to be the rose of Sharon. But I am still your shield and your buckler and your Axe. Heaven is my throne and I rest my feet on earth. Earth is my footstool. I am God. Nobody elected me. Nobody appointed me. Nobody put me in position and nobody could take me out. I am God. There has never been another God before me. There is no God after me. I am in the beginning. God created the heaven and the earth. Not God was created. God created so 
away with all the people who are praying to the universe. You are praying to the creation. I am talking about the creator. God is the creator of all of the creation. He made every tree that budded. He made every blossom that bloomed. He made every fish that swam. He made every man that walked. He made every breath that you breathe. He made your lungs to regulate while you were asleep. He kept your temperature while you were dreaming you were somewhere else. He woke you up this morning with a kiss of love. He's God. He's God. He's God all by himself. When you hear me praising him, I am praising somebody. He has a plan. He has a purpose. He has a protocol. He's never been shocked. He's never been surprised. He's never been stumped. They've never asked him a question that he couldn't answer. He's never come up with a need that he couldn't supply. He's never wanted anything that he couldn't create. He's God all by himself. He sat by the well asking for water and then told her I am water. God has never wanted anything that he was not. Whatever God is, he was, he will be. He is God. When you praise God, understand God is not a building. God is not a man. God is not a denomination. God is not a country. God is not a creed. God is God. God has all power. 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 And here we begin to see the mastermind of God. The strategist that he is. In the beginning was the Logos and the Logos was with God and the Logos was God. All things were made by him. Logos is not just word, it's thought. God's thoughts are so strong. He said, my thoughts of you are good and not evil that you might have an expected end. He comes to the graveyard of Lazarus and says, I could think you out of the grave. I could wake you up with a thought. But for the benefit of them that don't believe, I'm going to say it out loud. Lazarus, come forth. But if I didn't say it, it wouldn't be powerful. I could think it and it would happen. God is a God of thought. He is an intelligent God. You better count on it because God has thought you through. From the beginning to the end. And everything about your beginning is preparing you for your ending. So when we come into the middle of this text, we are coming into the middle of the life of the Apostle Paul. But we are not coming into the middle of a plan that has not been prepared, pre-designed predetermined from the beginning. We are just now starting to understand why would God pick Paul to be an apostle? He wasn't with Jesus in his life. He was against Jesus in his death. He was a Christian killer, a galvanizer of all of those who believed in Christ. He had made a reputation for catching them and dragging them back to Jerusalem and have them be tried. Why? did God in the book of Acts arrest him on the road to Damascus and said I have need of you it is hard for you to kick against the pricks when I want you I'm going to get you oh no 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 don't tell me what you're not going to do when I want you I'm going to get you don't tell me you won't serve me because when I want you I'm going to get you either you come walking up the aisle or you come rolling up the aisle or they bring you in a stretcher up the aisle or they bring you in a buyer up the aisle but when I want you I'm going to get you I'm God I'm God do you understand me I'm God God called Paul. Paul thought he was a bad man. He thought he was tough. His name was Saul. His Roman name was Paul. He was initially referred to as Saul. Saul, Saul, it is hard for you to kick against the pricks. And Saul, who was leading men, ended up being led by the men he was leading. Watch this. He lost. Oh, oh, he he lost his eyesight for several days, but it was worth it to get his insight. For insight is always better 
good eyesight. They asked Helen Keller, it must be terrible to be born blind. She said, oh, it's not so bad. It's better than to be born with no vision. There's a difference between eyesight and vision. Paul lost his eyes, but he gained his vision and he found out who Jesus was. But it was years before we find out why Jesus chose him. You see the reason in my text that Paul is on the ship is because they were afraid to kill him before he boarded because he was a citizen of Rome. They had no choice but to excommunicate him lest Caesar be offended by them killing a citizen of Rome. So they put him on the boat to go to Rome. <laughs> and as they put him on the boat, they were putting him right where God wanted him. Because the purpose of God was to get the gospel to Rome. You remember when Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives and he wept on the Mount of Olives? And the Bible said he sat on the Mount of Olives and he wept and he cried and he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how off would I have gathered you as a hen does her chicks? But ye would not. Behold, your house shall be left desolate. In other words, Ichabod has happened again. Even Jesus was crucified outside the gates of Jerusalem. <laughs> it was a testament that God was saying, I'm through with you. And now Paul, in traveling to Rome, is moving the epicenter of the Christian faith from its, orth from its orthodoxy in Jerusalem. He must reach Rome because Rome is going to be the epicenter of the New Testament church. Because the Jews have rejected him, he now moves to Rome. Am I boring you? He now moves to Rome that the church might be established amongst those least worthy of it. The gospel has come to the Gentiles. The children's bread has come to the dogs. The dogs now enjoy the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Oh, you shouldn't put me up tonight. I feel like preaching. The, the, the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And Paul is carrying those crumbs to Jerusalem in a boat to Rome in a storm. And whenever the enemy wants to stop you from reaching your destination, he will always send a stone. He has no new tricks. He's an imitator, not a creator. What we see in Luke, we have also seen in the Gospels before. You remember when Jesus got ready to go to the tomb of Gadarenes and he was sleeping in the bottom of the ship and the Bible says out of nowhere a storm broke out? Wouldn't you think an experienced fisherman like, Paul, or like Peter who grew up in the sea would know when to set sail? He didn't see this storm coming. You know why he didn't see this storm coming? It wasn't a natural storm. A natural storm will create dark clouds and thundering and lightning. And any wise fisherman would know this would be a bad day to make the journey. But this storm comes out of nowhere because it is not a natural storm. I don't know who I'm preaching to 
today. But the Lord sent me here to tell you what you're fighting with is not a natural storm. This is not a normal storm. This is not a normal attack. This is an attack that blindsided you. It came out of nowhere. It came up right at a time in your life that you weren't expecting to have to deal with anything else. And you said, I didn't even see it coming. The devil never meant for you to see it coming because this is not a natural storm. This is a demonic storm. This is a spiritual attack. This is a storm that only comes when you are close to delivery. This kind of storm only happens when you are close to delivery. Oh, the pain, the travail of it all only comes when you're close to delivery. And I heard Peter when he walked down to the bow of the ship and threatened Jesus threaten not threaten question his ability do you love me carry out not that we perish and Jesus is on his way to cast the devil out of the man in the tomb of Gadarenes so the enemy sent the storm to stop him and Jesus is asleep on the ship and Peter wakes him up <clears throat> Jesus wakes up and wipes his sleep out of his eye. He rises up to the stern of the boat and looks out at the storm, the winds and the waves and the hurricanes and I ask myself a litany of questions. What is it about your rest that storms don't wake you? What is it about your sleep pattern that thunder did not disturb you? What is it about the way you rest that lightning did not move you? And yet the cry of your child wakes up your sleep. Oh my God, if the devil knew who he was fooling with, he wouldn't fool with me because my voice is, my voice is louder than thunder. It's brighter than lightning. My voice is more to that's sure it's in winds and waves. What winds and waves and lightning and thunder could not do. Peter down in the bow of the ship saying, Carousel, not that we pay. Woke him right up. He woke right up. Somebody in here is about to wake up Jesus. Oh, I don't know where you are, but you're about to wake up Jesus. You don't understand the power you got. If you open your mouth, you'll wake up Jesus. That's why if you, when you get depressed, the first thing the devil wants you to do is sit there with your lips glued together, feeling sorry for yourself, lost your praise and lost your victory because the devil knows that lightning don't wake up Jesus. Thunder don't wake up Jesus. But but if one of his children holler at him, he will wake right up. If I had one child that would open their mouth and holler, a sound sleep and walked over to the bow of the ship wiping sleep out his eye and it's here where he reveals the nature of the storm he doesn't say storm stop it storm you're scaring my children The Bible said he rebuked the winds and the waves. You don't rebuke weather. You don't rebuke weather. You rebuke spirits. When he rebuked it, I knew it was a spirit. You got some stuff that you've been trying to get to leave you alone, but you need to rebuke it. You need to rebuke it right now. You need to open your mouth and rebuke it. It's not your daughter that's the problem. It's not your husband. It's a spirit. And if you rebuke it for what it is, it's going to have to get out of your way. When he rebuked the spirit, the winds lay prostrate in the floor, and the waves laid down and said, I can't take it no more. They heard the master's 
voice that said let there be light and they were slain by the power of his word he sent his word and his word healed them he sent his word and they were slain I can see his word slaying tumors and cancers and diseases and infirmities and poverty and fear with nothing but his word God is getting ready to shut some stuff down that three people say shut it down God is getting ready to shut it down he's getting ready to shut it shut 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 God is getting ready to shut it down I feel the echo of the Holy Ghost. I feel the tremors of an earthquake. God is getting ready to shut it down. Hallelujah to God. Somebody who's got some faith to believe it. Shout a praise to God for shutting it down. So here we are in our text. The enemy's up to his same old stuff again. He only has one thing that might stop Paul, and it's a storm. And so even though it didn't work on Jesus, maybe it will work on Paul. And he sent the storm to stop him. Because if Paul gets to Rome, If Paul gets to Rome, it won't matter what the chief priest said. It won't matter what the Sadducees said. It won't matter what the Pharisees said. If Paul gets to Rome, then the epicenter of the church will shift and the gospel will break out all over the world and people will be set free and delivered and healed. And for God's sake, he can't let him get to Rome. So he sent a storm. He didn't send the storm because he didn't like Paul. He didn't send the storm because Paul is afraid of storms. Paul had been shipwrecked three times, left for dead. Paul had been stoned. Paul had been to hell and back. Paul wasn't no imp. He wasn't no whip. He wasn't somebody who would run from some thunder. He sent the storm to shut him down. He was after his destination. Not his comfort. Hear me when I tell you. The enemy isn't trying to disrupt your comfort. He's trying to shut down your destination. Because he knows if you get to the place that God has ordained for you to get, that people's yokes will be broken. Bondages will be destroyed. The captives will be set free. The bound will be loose. Somebody stretch out and say, I got to get there. I gotta get there. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, I got to get there. Come hell or high water, I got to get there. I'm tired, but I gotta get there. I'm sick, but I gotta get there. I'm old, but I gotta get there. I'm weak, but I gotta get there. I'm lonely, but I gotta get there. I'm unloved, but I gotta get there. They don't like me, but I gotta get there. Can I preach on a little further? And so the Bible says, Paul had warned them about the storm. He had prophesied about the storm. They wouldn't listen to him. And now they're in what they could have avoided because they wouldn't listen to him. And they are sending him to Rome because they are afraid not of Paul or of God, but of Caesar. Isn't it funny how God will use your enemies to protect you? <laughs> I'm almost done. And they were sensing in the text that they were almost there. 
Now this is an arduous, difficult, complicated task because how you act when you're almost there is totally different from how you act when you're just getting started. <laughs> you handle things a little bit differently because there's a thin line between being almost there and crashing. Most car accidents happen within a few miles of home. Just when you're almost there, that's when it hits you. Catch you in a vulnerable place and try to take you out. If you learn this, you will glory in tribulation. Because if you can learn what I'm teaching you, the storm is an indicator that you're almost there. Somebody that's got some faith in the room, just say, I'm almost there. Yeah, yeah, I'm almost, I'm almost there. I'm almost there. I would have fainted, but I'm almost there. I would have given up, but I'm almost there. I would have walked away, but I'm almost there. I would have quit the job, but I'm almost there. I would have given up the business, but I'm almost there. I would have let you have my position, but I'm almost there. I got too much in it. I got too much skin in the game. I worked too hard. I sweated too long. I fought too much to get to this level and let you stare me down and make me give up my stuff. I don't care how you look at me. I don't care how you roll your eyes at me. I don't care how you talk about me. I don't care what you say about me. Don't you understand I'm almost there and if I handle these next few months right, I'm gonna step into a press down, shaking together, running over, supernatural miracle. I need about 30 seconds of crazy praise that'll rise up in this house. Rise it up! Rise it up! I gotta be careful how I handle these next few steps because I'm, I'm almost there. I gotta, I gotta watch out a little bit more than I used to have to watch out because I'm almost there. I can't afford to trip up right now because I'm too close to my promise. I'm too close to my breakthrough. I'm too close to my deliverance. I'm too close to my healing. I'm almost there. And when they figured that they were about 15 furlongs from the bottom of the ocean, they began to think about if we get too close to the shore, we might hit underground obstacles that would cause the boat to sink. And so they dropped their anchors. Yeah. The reason they dropped their anchors is an attempt to stabilize their surroundings. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And you want your surroundings to be stabilized so you can exit your boat with class. Everybody likes to exit their boat with class. You, 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 you don't want anybody taking a picture of you while you're getting out of the car. <laughs> Once you get out and you got everything shifted and you're together, you say, okay, all right. But this, the goal of the journey, watch this, if you miss this, you're gonna miss everything. 
The goal of the journey was to get Paul to Rome, not to save the ship. Yeah. 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 Not to save the ship. God doesn't care about the ship. The anchors that are dropped are dropped in an attempt to stabilize the ship. And here these men are trying to get off the ship and Paul says, stay on the ship. You will not arrive alive if you don't stay on the ship. Excuse me, Paul. Why do you want me to stay on something that's getting ready to break up? Why would you put me in a church, in a city, in a country, in a nation at a time like this? Why would you ask me to stay in something that looks like it's about to break up? Why would you encourage me to stick to something that's about to be shattered? Why would you ask me to stay on a ship that's out of control? So these guys started acting like they were dropping anchors but they were really trying to get away in small ships because they were not sure if the ship would be stabilized. Right, right. But you see, God never promised to save the ship. Right. He only promised to save the people. So he let the ship shatter but only close to shore. Y'all ain't gonna let me preach. See, the anchor ensured that it didn't shatter too far to swim. So the Bible says, that when the ship began to break, they had put ropes up under it to slow down its breaking, called helps, which were ropes to undergird it, to stabilize it against the storm. But the storm got to the ship. And when the storm gets to the ship, it is natural to conclude, if the ship is going down, I'm going down. If the job is going down, I'm going down. If the economy's going down, I'm going down. If the ministry's going down, I'm going down. If the people don't like her, I'm going down. If the people don't like him, I'm going down because the temptation is to think that association brings about assimilation. But the reality is, you can be associated with something that you're not assimilated with, and it is possible for it to shatter in its original form so that it can be reborn in a new form. And sometimes we're so busy trying to hold things to the form that it used to be in that we're not open to how God is transforming it into another form. And the new form is going to be better than the old form. But we're in love with the old form and we won't let God do what he needs to do to create a new form. I decree and declare 
there's going to be a new form and a new system and a new structure and a new way of doing things and a new way that you have not seen before your eyes have not seen your ears have not heard neither have they entered into your heart the things that God has in store for them that love him God's getting ready to do it in a new form in a new way and the problem with most church folk is just like you were in the Bible you only recognize Jesus when he comes in an old form whenever he comes walking across the water you think he's a ghost because you only recognize Jesus through your old vision and when he changes his vision you say it's not God and there you got 12 disciples sitting on a boat saying Jesus is a ghost because they don't love Jesus they love his form and Peter and Paul is on a boat that is shattered in its form but committed to its destiny are you with me if I got you I can make it on in you got me you got me? You got me because what people don't realize is that all God needed was a peace. He is more glorified in our pieces than he is in our wholeness. Let me say it to you in a way you'll recognize it. His strength is made perfect in our weakness. If the boat were left whole, you would praise the boat. But if the entire boat shatters, you don't have nobody else to praise but God. I need a thousand people that don't have nobody else to praise but God. Call it out your mouth and give I don't have nobody else. I don't need nobody else. I don't want nobody else. I got God. God did it. 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 I got to praise him. I got to praise him. I got, I got, I got, I got. So this is what, this is what I'm sent to say to you. Unshaken does not mean that everything around you will not be shaken. Because the Bible said that everything that can be shaken will be shaken. So that those things that cannot be shaken might remain and so there's going to be a shake out for you to be unshaken and you're going to find out that some of your friends are shaky and some of your family is shaky and some of your neighbors are shaky and all of that's got to shake away from you somebody just shake a little bit it's got to shake away it's got to shake away Stop grieving over it. It's got to shake away. 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 Stop crying about it. Stop crying about it. Stop crying about it. Stop crying about it. It's got to shake away. <laughs> Everything that can be shaken must be shaken. So you can say, I'm still here. Piece of both, but I'm still. Yeah. And here's the problem, my brothers and sisters. Sometimes we're so in love with the boat. that we would rather die with the boat than to float on the pieces. 
You love your boat. It brought you all this way. You got history with the boat. You're used to the boat. You're accustomed to the boat. You don't want God to allow anything to mess with the boat. You sanded it, you nailed it, you made it, you glued it, you put it together, you varnished it, you took care of it, you maintained it. You can't do that if you don't love the boat. And now God sends a storm and it tears up everything you've invested time into making. And you are so depressed, you're about to go down with the boat than to grab hold to the pieces. The only person who would grab a piece is somebody who loves their destination more than they love their transportation. If you love your destination more than you love your transportation, you don't worry about glamour, you don't worry about first class or second class, you don't worry about what you got on and what people think about you. If you want your destination, you're saying, any way you bless me, Lord, I will be satisfied. I don't care what I look like. I don't care what I got to put on. I don't care what I got to do. I don't care what I got to say. I just got to get there. I got to get there. I want to talk to some people that got to get there. You just got to get there. Any way you bless me, Lord, I just got to get there. I don't care whether it's on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram. I got to get there. I don't care if it's in a building. I don't care if it's on a site. I got to get there. There's something in me that's screaming and it's got to get out. It's got to get out. It's got to get out. And I'll take pieces. I'll take fragments. I'll take loaves. I'll take crumbs. I'll take two fish, five loaves of bread. I'll take the hem of his garment. I'll take a pot of oil. I'll take a handful of meal but whatever you give me I'm coming out if I got to come out on pieces I'm coming out if I got to crawl by myself I'm coming out if I gotta get wet I'm coming out if I gotta look like a fool I just need a thousand desperate people that's ready to come out and you don't care what you look like you coming out slap your neighbor on your left and your right and tell him I'm coming out you can stay in here if you want to, but I'm coming out. You can look around if you want to, but I'm coming out. You can hate on me if you please, but I'm coming out. Any way it takes for me to get out, I'm getting out of this. I don't have to look cute. I don't have to be important. You don't have to call my name. You don't have to bake me a cake. I'm coming out. The reason I'm at House on the Rock tonight is that I'm trying to get out. Any way I can, I'm going to get out. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but I'm preaching to somebody in this room. If I'm preaching to you, identify yourself. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm coming out. I'm coming out. If my wife don't come, if my husband don't come, if my children don't come, if my job don't come, I made up my mind. I'm coming out. If I have to grab a piece, if I have to grab a board, if I have to grab a nail, whatever it takes to get me out, I got to get out of this. I got places to go. I got people to see. I got books to write. I got songs to sing. I got movies to do. I got jobs to complete. I got businesses to start. I didn't come this far to allow this storm to stop me. The devil is a lie. Though the storms keep on raging in my life and lightning is flashing everywhere. Slap your neighbor and say, excuse me, I'm coming out. I'm coming out. I'm coming out. If you don't move, I'm going to step on you. If you don't step back, I'm going to step around you. Because I made up my mind. I got too much in this not to come out. I'm coming out. If I have to come out on my hands and knees,
knees. I'm coming out. If I have to crawl on my belly, where are my desperate folk? I'm coming out. I made up my mind. I wouldn't be in this meeting if I weren't coming out. I'm going to give you 60 seconds to praise God like you desperate, like you crazy. Praise him all the way at the top. When you praise him right, the anointing is going to fall from balcony to balcony, from level to level. I feel a glory in this room, an anointing in this place. Something's going to happen in here tonight. Something's going to happen in here tonight. Open your mouth and holler. I want you to understand the anchors in the text means you are in close proximity. Doesn't mean your boat won't bust. But it will only bust when you're in close proximity. Naomi sent Ruth to glean in the fields of Boaz in the corner of the field behind the reapers. She wasn't in the center. She was in close proximity. The Holy Ghost has put you in close proximity. So that even if the boat doesn't make it, there's enough boards. <laughs> I don't claim to have the whole thing, son. I just got a board. In my country, they call it a surf board. <laughs> When other people are running away from the waves, people with surfboards are running to the waves because all you need is a board, <laughs> just a little piece of fragment. And if you can get your feet on solid ground on something that won't break, you can ride the wave. Ah! I don't know who I'm talking to, but I feel like God me in Nigeria talking to somebody. You have been holding your board waiting on your boat. And God said, if he'd have meant for you to have a boat, the boat would have survived. He's going to bring you out with a board. And when he brings you out, you're going to know it was him. Because what God is getting ready to do in your life, it's going to be fragmented. It's going to be broken. And it doesn't matter how much it shakes. You must remain. So here I am. I'm standing here. I'm standing here. 
in a shaky situation. But as long as the situation don't get in me, we're going to talk about that in the morning. In the morning, if you're here, I'm going to talk about keeping the situation around you from getting in you. Watch this. We are too moved by what is around us. When everything mighty is hit a couple, everything mighty that you will ever do in your life will not come through what is around you. It will come from what is inside of you. Now unto him that's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we may ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. And tonight as I just break ground on my assignment, this is a message of admonition. cautionary tale a clarion call an exposition from the expounder himself he told me to tell you don't let the storm stop It didn't stop your mama. It didn't stop your grandmama. It didn't stop your great grandmama. It didn't stop your great granddaddy. It didn't stop your great grandmama. It didn't stop your granddaddy. It didn't stop none of them. None of them had what you got to work with. God said, don't let the storm. Stop you. As I close. I got five minutes left. One of the hardest things that I have had to learn in the soon 50 years of my ministry, my businesses, my companies, my family, my father, my wife and I are now married 42 years. That's the old resume. We're not married 42 years because we didn't have storms. I didn't produce films because we didn't have storms. Derek could tell you the last two films we did, we did them in the, in the middle of COVID. At its height. Wrapped up in saran wraps looking like sandwiches. <laughs> but we produced it. If I waited for the storms to stop, If I waited on the storms to stop, I wouldn't have traveled around the world. If I waited on the storms to stop, I wouldn't have built everything that was in my spirit and in my vision. If I waited on the storms to stop, I wouldn't be engaged in trying to bring the African diaspora together to understand the fact that we would do better together than we do apart. We have tried being apart for thousands of years and look where it got us. Maybe we should try getting together like all the other people in the earth do. Maybe we are better together than we are apart. But you love your ship more than you love your boards. You love being right more than you love being married. So you will argue with her until you prove you're right. Never understanding right never saved a marriage. Oh, stand there. I'm going to get to you. I'm coming right to you. I'm coming right to you and your mouth who's fighting for the ship and going down with it. 
because you're going to show that girl you're stronger than her. I'm your mother. And there you are at 50 fighting with somebody that's in their 20s. You're fighting with your own genes in a younger form. And the whole ship is about to go down because you don't know how to float on a piece. I would rather have a piece and make it in than go down with the ship. I don't know, this is the weird thing about preaching. It's like being a mailman. You deliver the mail, but you don't know what's in the envelope. I'm talking to you about stuff that only you and God know specifically what, what we're talking about. I am here to tell you that being petty doesn't pay. I am here to tell you that sometimes you can't sweat the small stuff. You got to be willing to let the ship go and let him bring you in on a board. I want to pray for people who have a board and you thought it was nothing. And this message reminded you that as close as you are now, if you just stand on what you got, let me give it to you in biblical language. Strengthen the things that remain that are ready to die. You got a board. Hear me good, young people. It's enough. You're enough. I know it's fragmented and cracked and your life hasn't been perfect and you've been waiting on the whole ship and until they apologize for what they said to me, I just shut up. Nobody's going to apologize. Nobody's coming to get you. Nobody's going to rescue you. Nobody's going to leave you nothing. Nobody's going to hand you nothing. All you got is that peace. But if you hold on to that, that's enough. I want to pray for pieces. <laughs> I want to pray for pieces in a place where you are only recognized when you are whole. <laughs> the church only acknowledges people who say they're whole, even though they lied. The scariest offering I ever raised in a church was honesty because we are so afraid to look damaged especially in front of each other but I'm going to try it I want people who are holding on to a board to come forward The rest of you can sit down. I want people who are holding on to something that's cracked or shattered or tattered or torn or broken. Here I am, Lord. Nothing else to give. I'm tired, I'm weary, I'm worn, and when nobody's looking, I get real sad. 
but I'm still here. I'm still here. My money's looking kind of funny, but I'm, but I'm still here. I got a degree and no job, but Lord, I'm still here. A husband that won't talk to me, a wife that won't love me, but I'm still here. Holding on to pieces, holding on to pieces, but I'm still here. With all I got left, I'm still here. I can't hear you open your mouth and sing it. Tell God I'm still here. I'm waiting on you. 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 I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm waiting on you. I'm waiting on you. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Got my head up on The theme is no accident. When God says, don't let the storm stop you, he's challenging you to remain unshaken. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to take you deeper in this because I want this to get in your heart. I don't want this to be just some church service you had. I want this to get in your DNA and your philosophy and how you raise your children and how you talk to yourself and how you think about you. I want you to stop saying stuff to you that's making you worse. The way you talk to yourself the way you think about your circumstances determines your outcome. Suppose Paul would have said, oh, the ship is gone, that's it. <laughs> Paul said, let me grab this board and see what it'll do. You got something to grab, grab it. You got something to say, say it. You got something to write, write it. You got something to build, build it. Stop crying about who wasn't there, who didn't love you, who didn't spend enough time, who didn't talk to you. You ain't got time for none of that. Grab the board. Thank them for the board. Thank you for this little piece I got. I can skirt off of that. I can skirt off of that. It's probably more than what you had to skirt off of. I, I can make it. If Paul would have went down with the ship, there would likely not be a New Testament church. No wonder the enemy sent the storm. It wasn't just about the man. It was the plan God had. And in order for Paul to do it and all the great work he'd done, he had to be in Rome to do this. He had to be in Rome because he was a citizen of Rome. He could get indoors, other people couldn't get. Him. 
and as much preaching as Peter did. Peter was a Jew out of Jerusalem. He did not have the influence of Paul who was a citizen of Rome. God places you in situations so that you can influence situations that other people couldn't influence. Let me stop. I'm sorry. I can't stop. When you love people, you just can't stop. You start pouring into them because you see something in them that they don't always see in themselves. In the morning, we will talk again. But tonight, we're going to pray that this word that you heard does not slip. raised, hearts open, spirits look into the sky. The scariest thing in the world is for your ship to go down on you when you're almost there. And you're tossed out to the sea and the sea is cold and you're wet and it's uncomfortable and Nigeria is uncomfortable and you are uncomfortable. It's not just Lagos, it's not just your country. You are uncomfortable. You're only uncomfortable, mama, because you're close. And as you raise your hands to God, I'm going to ask God to strengthen your grip. Amen. That you hold fast to that which you have and let no man take your crown. Amen. <laughs> I don't know, Sha. Is in this place and there will be change there will be change in your life there will be change in your strategy there will be change in how you talk to yourself there will be change in how you move forward God is up to something in your life and you gotta believe it And he's only using the storm to get you closer. Don't let the storm drive you away from God and now you're away from God. No, come close, come, come close, come crying, come weeping, come worshiping, come wailing, come praying. The storm is not meant to cause you to backslide. The storm is meant to cause you to upslide. Your hands are raised. Your hearts are open. The Spirit of God is falling fresh on you. It's falling fresh on you. Right now with your hands up, God is strengthening your grip. He is strengthening your grip like never before. Just when you felt like you were going to faint, just when you thought you were going to die, just when you thought you couldn't take anymore, just when you were at your wit's end, just when you were about to throw in the towel, the Holy Ghost 
is strengthening your grip. Now this is between you and God and God and you. You and God and God and you. You and God and God and you. You can't worry about the person next to you and the person three rows back. You got to use your own language, your own praise, your own worship, your own way of communicating with God to reach into the glory of God and snatch out of the spirit what the Holy Ghost has for you tonight. You got to get it any way you can. You, if you got to jump, jump. You got to jump. If you got to lay, lay. If you have to holler, if you have to holler. If you have to call him by a name, you got to call him by your name. He knows your language. He knows you. He knows what you're going through. He knows what happened to you. He knows what's going on in your house. He knows your secrets. He knows your business. He knows your burdens. He knows your sorrows. The Holy Ghost has got a warrant for your arrest. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. I need some surfers. I need some people that are making on the pieces. Some people that are making on a board. Some people that are making on a splinter. Oh, if I get a crumb, I'll make it out of this. Give me the crumb that fall from the master's table. I just need a crumb. A crumb will save my daughter. A crumb will save my marriage. A crumb will save my business. I can't hear you.